So that's it. I'm going to kick off today by asking a very simple question. How do you describe a city? How do you describe London? Well, that's the question that my partner at Chocolate Films, Rachel Wang, asked me in the summer of 2011. And I don't know if you remember then, but London wasn't that great then. There were riots in the streets, and also nobody was really that happy about the Olympics coming up. And we sat down and we talked about it for a while, and every single answer we seemed to get the opposite seemed to apply. We were like, you know, London, is, you know, it's really prosperous at the moment, but it's also really poor. It's really colorful and vibrant, but it's also really gray and dull. London's cutting edge, but it's also got this massive, deep heritage. There was nothing we could really do that seemed to sum up the city. And at that moment, we realized that we just discovered what we wanted our next film project to be. We were going to create a portrait of a city. Now, that's a pretty bold ambition. And we started off by thinking, how on earth are we going to attempt this? How on earth are we going to try this? And what we did was we started off by thinking about the obvious things. You know, there's iconic buildings, there's tube maps, there's road maps. But none of that really captured what we wanted to look for, which was something which was a little bit deeper, something that looked a little bit deeper into London. So we thought a little bit further. And we realized that there was a problem with all of this. Because what I saw as London wasn't what Rachel saw as London. And what she saw as London probably isn't what you'd see as London, or what you'd see as London, or what you'd see as London. We all have a completely different perspective on the city. And that was when we realized that everybody has their own personal London. London is different for every single person in this room and every single person in the city. And we thought about that for a little bit longer, and we started to break it down. And it seemed like there were three parts to what we started thinking the kind of London we wanted to capture was. And the first thing was, obviously, the places and spaces. Now, clearly, there's shards and domes and all that kind of stuff. But what we kind of mean by this is the places that we each associate with our city. For me, it's my home in South London. It's my office in Brixton. It's my daughter's school. Those are like my, the places that I probably spend most of my time in, and all the journeys in between them. My London is the school I went to in Wimbledon for eight years. And all those places that I used to nip into on the way home to, to try and avoid going home. So the Dayville's ice cream shop on the way home on Wimbledon Hill, where they used to have the Daily Thompson decathlon machine. That was part of my London. But that shop isn't there anymore, and that machine's not there anymore. There's UCL, that's where I went to university. That must have changed immeasurably since I was last there. And then all those places that I lived in when I was there. It's where I met my wife, which was a comedy club on Tottenham Court Road, which is now Spearmint Rhinos. <laughs> That's not great for going back on romantic occasions. <laughs> my London's also the rooms in St. Thomas's Hospital where my two kids were born. Now, obviously, they're, they're completely different now. There's probably somebody else in there right now experiencing something pretty magnificent for, as part of their London. But beyond that, we also realized that we each have our own imaginary city. And that's the bits that you haven't seen before. I mean, clearly you might have heard about them or you know they're there, but you might not have actually been to them. And for me, I can give you a bunch of examples. I've, um, I've never run the London Marathon. I've never been to a, a trading floor in a city bank. I've never been inside a mosque in London or a synagogue. I've never slept on a narrowboat. There's all sorts of different things that I haven't done, but I've got an idea of what these places are like. I'm sure every single one of you does as well if you haven't been to all these places. But I've never been there. They're part of my imaginary city. And then more than that, we realize that what's fundamental is the people. You know, my, my, my people are you know, the people that I love my friends, the people I work with, but then there's also all those other people, the people you see on the tube, the people that you see on the bus, the people you walk down the street and see on the street. And we realize that if you put all those three together, you get a pretty kind of distinct idea of what your personal London is. Now, Rachel and I could have easily gone out at that point and made a subjective vision of London. We could have shot our two ideas of what the city was, but that's not going to do anybody an awful lot of good. If you haven't noticed that in my personal London, I don't go very far west or very far east very often. 
So what we realized that was that to paint our portrait of London, what we wanted to do was we wanted to capture all the personal Londons. We wanted to capture everybody's, and like a big, big collage, put them all together into one picture, which we thought might begin to represent our city. At that point, we came up with a bit of an issue, which is how do you make 8.6 million portraits? Because at this moment, there's more people living in London than ever in the history, ever in history. So um, for that, we actually found quite a simple answer, which is that whenever anybody wants to find out how London's going to vote, how London, well, what, what shoe color London likes, they always go and ask a thousand people. And we check with a statistician, and that's actually a, a fantastic sample size for London. So what we figured was that if we went out, and if we went out and filmed not one film anymore, but a thousand short films about a thousand people, then we might get something that might resemble a portrait of London. So that's what we're doing, and we called it A Thousand Londoners. So uh, I'm going to show you a few of them now. So, we started filming, and we have filmed the last cloth trader in Shoreditch. We filmed a beef eater, we filmed a cabbie, we filmed a Chelsea pensioner. We filmed a 13-year-old boy who's treating his ADHD by learning sleight of hand magic. We've treated an elderly woman who travels from Acton to Tooting once a week to learn knitting, even though she's visually impaired. We filmed all sorts of people, but we realized that that wasn't enough perspectives. Because what we were actually doing, if we go out and film 1,000 people, what you're actually getting is the perspectives of 12 people who are in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who are all interested in making social documentaries. And to be honest, that's not terribly representative. So at that point, we realized that what we actually had to do was we had to expand the project even further. We couldn't just go off and, and do everything ourselves. We had to find ways of getting into other people's networks and encouraging other people to get involved in the project. So first off, what we did was we set up an open submission. We found ways, working with Design Festival, London Short Film Festival, to get other people to submit their own films. And that went really well. And then we realized that, yes, we've got more filmmakers making films, but what we also want to do is we want to ensure that the people making the films aren't just filmmakers, so we started running workshops. And now we've got films being made by people who are age seven, and we've also got films being made by people who are age 55. And the films being made in, with people in schools and colleges, with places like the Roundhouse, we've got uh, people from Lambeth Autism Group, we've got people from Providence Row Homelessness Charity all making films. And that's, getting us, that's opening up our eyes even further. And what it's actually doing is it's making us learn more about London all the time, because at the beginning of every single workshop, we just ask the simple question, who would you include? We're painting a portrait of a thousand different people, and every single one of those is going to show a little bit about London. Who would you put in? And what happened was, for example, we met Hannah. Now, Hannah was a friend of somebody on the workshop. She lives in South London. She's the first girl in her family to go to university, and she, uh, as beyond that, she's doing an MSc at Oxford. She's absolutely fascinating and had loads of great ideas. We've got Robin. If any of you live in Crouch End, you might recognize Robin. He's dressed in Georgian clothing ever since he was a child. It's just what he does. Um, but he's a Londoner. Or there's Dick, for example. Dick customizes Triumph motorcycles down in South London, and they test them out on an empty airstrip in North London. Dick is pretty awesome as well. But if we're going to get all these different people making films, then we had to set up some rules. So first of all, we had to define what a Londoner was. And first, we did say from the very beginning, the Londoners have to be human and alive. That was, <laughs> that was decided. We're making a contemporary vision of London. We're not going to try and do the whole thing. So yeah, no Shakespeare's or Dickens or anything like that. 
but our rule was you're a Londoner if you say you are. And just to illustrate that, when we were, we were making a film about um, the, the man who opens and closes Tower Bridge, and the first one we were going to shoot has lived in London for 50 years, he's been working in London for 50, 50 years, he opens and closes Tower Bridge, and just before the shoot we asked him, are you a Londoner? And he said, no, no, I'm an Essex boy. <laughs> Which kind of confounded us a little bit, and then we went and got one of his colleagues, and we made a film about one of his colleagues who did say he was a Londoner. Um, at the same time, we get people like this. This is John Jasinski. He'd been in England for six months. It's our only film that isn't in English. It's in Polish and subtitled. And we asked him if he was a Londoner, and he was like, yes, absolutely, I am, because he'd come here, and he'd come here to set up his life here. So that's the first rule. Second rule, everybody is important. Now, this seems pretty crucial to us, because other people do lists of the most rich people or the most powerful people, the most influential people. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to show a bit of everything. So everybody has to be important. And to build on that, everybody has to be equal. Everybody gets treated with exactly the same length of film. Every, every film's kind of around the same length, but also with the same kind of conditions that they're made under. And also, every film just starts with a first name. So that makes quite a big difference if you've got somebody like Sir Nicholas Sorota, the beginning of his film is just Nick. Or Ken Livingston is just Ken. It puts, them, puts everybody onto exactly the same level when the film begins. And beyond that, everybody's interesting. <laughs> now, this is something that people have questioned us on in the past, but we figure that if somebody isn't interesting, then that's probably the filmmaker's fault. So our goal is to go out and make sure that no matter who we're filming, we find something that really makes us go, oh, God, that is pretty fascinating. I put this guy up here. He's called Shara Ali. He's deputy leader of the Green Party, and obviously he does lots of kind of talks about you know, green policies and stuff. We found out he's got a PhD in lying and deception in public office. <laughs> we figured that made him even more interesting. So... The other thing is that every film, and this is pretty crucial to us as well, every film is co-created. And what that means is that we're not going out to stitch anybody up. No matter who they are, we're going to make a film with them. If they say they don't want something to be in the film, that's fine, and every film is short. Every film runs at about three minutes, which means that if you put them all together, it makes one definition of London, which is about 50 hours long, which I guess is quite big. It's about the same as maybe two and a half seasons of Breaking Bad or something. So it's, it's not too big, but it's, you know, it's still pretty, pretty weighty. We're now 62 Londoners in. Okay? This is number 63. This is Gloria, who's going out next week. And a lot of people have come up to us over the last few months and said, that's going to take you forever, isn't it? And we're like, yeah, yeah, but that's kind of the point. I mean, that's pretty much important, because as the project is growing, more and more people are getting involved, either by watching the films, or suggesting people, or suggesting ways we can get the films out there, or joining one of our Young Ambassadors programs, or joining a workshop, or getting us in to run a workshop in their business. In all sorts of different ways, people are getting involved. And what we're finding is that we're seeing the most wonderful connections happening between people in the most brilliant way. And everybody's imaginary London is getting that little bit smaller or that little bit different because people are meeting each other all the time. So what happened was we started off with a very simple question, which is, how would you describe London? That turned into, how are we going to make a film about London? And it's now turned into, how on earth can we make the most expansive, the most deep, and the most comprehensive vision of a city that's ever been attempted using video. And we're pretty excited about that. When it comes down to the original question, how do you describe London? I mean, I don't know yet. I honestly don't know yet. But come back to me in 937 films time, and uh, I might have a little bit of a better answer then. Thank you very much.